<laughs> is it this? <laughs> it is really lovely to see so many people here. Thanks so much for coming. I, uh, I wrote to my lovely friend and colleague Sheila at about 5.15 saying, no, I'm not writing anything down. I know Zach super well. It's not a problem. But then Paula kind of inspired me to, she, she spoke about some things that kind of linked to Zach too. So I made a little list. Um, first, I'm really happy to introduce Zach Zai. He's a wonderful graduate of our program, beautiful student to have in, in the class. Um, some of my pals who teach with me totally agree. Um, I would say second that he's a really honorable classmate, that he never blew anyone off, very respectful of other people's opinions, which really makes the classroom feel correct and not creepy. <laughs> uh, he had an extraordinary commitment to first draft. So those of you that have been in my classes and have even just write more for him. He really was committed to first draft. So a great student in his class would turn in three first drafts and he would turn in 12. It was exhausting though. <laughs> but I have to say, you're in a writing program and it's graduate school for God's sake. So yeah, crank him up. And he did. Um, Zach was also willing to really uh, take advantage of what we really felt strongly about when we created this MFA program, which was to feel a great sense of freedom writing across genres, to honor what, what the hybrid spirit was in him, and to figure out week after week, this was an essay. You know, this might be a poem. Well, this might be a narrative poem, but it might also be. It was great to have a student who was willing to just keep going back and forth across those boundaries to figure out where his best writing was going to show up. Um, I. Look on my list, uh, his willingness to both honor and examine his deep religious faith. We've had um, people of many faiths in our program over the years, but I really appreciated Zach's willingness to to be to let faith be in the forefront and also to really to really examine it and think deeply about it and feel deeply about what his faith actually meant to him. And it links to me with Paula's uh, thing about uncomfortable questions. And in, in what arenas when we are very stressed and feel a level of discomfort can we do some great writing? And that happened. Um, the willingness to use the extraordinary, I think, education that he had already received and worked for. He's like not ashamed to have studied his ass, his studied really hard <laughs> all his years, and uh, to see his intelligence just come into his essays and his poems, and to drop a lot of names. <laughs> no, you know, he, he has a lot of reverence for a lot of different kinds of writers. So it's kind of cool to just say, yeah, put it in. Um, willingness to not cling to drafts or content that could not be saved. I have many memories of sitting with Zach at like 5.15, because he always had to finish class. No, I was like, a lot of meetings after he taught all day. And, uh, you know, some stuff was just not happening, and he was like, I agree, it's not happening. And it could go away, and the reason it could go away is because he wrote so many first drafts. <laughs> um, and a great willingness to learn, to acknowledge his, his privilege, his foibles, his smartness, his... You know, he just was open to to the many kinds of writers we study in this program. And then he wrote a really good book. And then the, the funny thing about Zach is he wrote a really good book and published it in the middle of getting his MFA. And then he wrote another really good book. So I hope that one finds a home too. But uh, this thesis project is beautiful. I recommend always that you check things out of the library or out of our little CWP house and read, you should for sure read the people who are speaking tonight. So, super happy to be his teacher, one of his teachers, and drilled. excited to hear what he has to say. Deborah, thank you. I would not be here without Deborah's help. So, um, my process essay is called Uncursing and Blessing. The poet Christian Wyman writes beautifully about how poets write when they're not writing their poems. He believes their abstinence from poetry is important, has a
as valued. Speaking for himself, Wyman finds that it is in these moments that he has often discovered for himself what he's been thinking in the poems he has written and how he will move to the next poems he's moved to write. And he says, criticism will be valuable to the poet only insofar as it charts the waters where he's been, enables him to move away, and equips him for the next descent. I start with this passage from Wyman because my own approach to writing my thesis, as Deborah said, was complicated by the fact that I began assembling it just as I was publishing my first book of poetry. Uh, St. Paul lives here in Minnesota. Right away, Deborah and I decided I did not want to use any of the work in that published book in my thesis. I wanted to write something new. Deborah told me it would be help helpful to think of my thesis as my second book, which is what I did. Um, Again, returning to Wyman, as I moved and wrote and assembled the new poems for the thesis, I actually found myself returning more and more often to prose, to criticism. Um, and looking back on it, I can see that this work also involved, as Wyman would put it, charting the water where I've been in the first book. And so that meant for me noticing what are things that I was doing in that first book? I was part of the process, and I saw actually a lot of what I was doing was blessing and cursing. Um, I'm going to start with a curse that I uh, composed in the first book because I think that's actually easier to do as a poet. I think it's easier to curse. Um, the poem that I'm going to read is from the first book. It's called If Dante Were Alive Today. Um, it's an angry poem. Um, it's written in response to the mess that our local Catholic Church finds itself in. It names two officials in, in our local Catholic Church, the former Archbishop and the former Vicar General. If Dante were alive today, if Dante were alive today, he'd put Kevin McDonough in the deepest circle of hell with the other corruptors' words. And like Archbishop Ruggieri, his head and brains would be lunch for another. Except instead of Ugolino feasting, it would be the arch, our arch, John Neinstead, wiping his face of the gruesome meal. And I know people in glass homes shouldn't throw stones. And yes, this poem is a stone, and I aim to hit. And yes, we're all in this Google age living in homes of glass. See our sins through the windows. And I bleed as you bleed, Kevin and John. Still, Watch me cock my arm, just so. Now watch me throw. I did feel a kind of palpable thrill run up and down my spine when I named the Archbishop and his chief deputy in this poem, and I still feel it a little bit when I read it. It was important to have written the poem and published it while I was a teacher at a Catholic school in this diocese. Maybe it wasn't a huge risk, but I felt I had something to lose. And I wanted that risk as I was writing. And I'm sure there's pride and there's blindness in that kind of a statement, but it's true. The poem seemed in some way to be speaking truth to power. And I wondered, starting the second book, what would speaking truth to power mean in my new work? What would political poetry look like in a second book? Stanley Kunitz, the poet, says, simply being a poet in the United States in the 21st century is a political act. But what kind of act? This is where the form of the essay, which my teachers at Hamlin, especially Deborah and Pat, always taught me to practice, was incredibly helpful. Um, throughout the writing of this uh, thesis, I was reading Tennessee Coates' Coates's wonderful letter to his son, many of you have probably read, Between the World and Me, and I was struck by its power and its grace. It's, it's really, I think Coates is a poet, in my opinion, only he writes prose. Coates, like all the poets I love, saw power simply in naming a great suffering, in this case, the effects of racial injustice on individuals and on communities. This issue was personal for me. It was not academic. I knew I believed in Cristo Rey, the high school I taught at, at the end of the year. And the more years I taught at this school, seven years, the more I became aware of the political awareness of my own students, an urban student body from low-income families, almost entirely Latino and African American, they felt in their bodies the racism I had come to understand from Coates in my mind. We never read between the world and me in any of my classes, but the issues of race and police violence were ever present in our class discussions. 
Some of my senior English students wondered aloud how safe they would be on certain college campuses, how safe they were now in the communities where they live. So I was recognizing from Coates and from my students the strength and power of naming a suffering, what biblical prophets call lamentation. At the same time, I was recognizing that lamentation often falls on deaf ears. I couldn't help but notice the faith tradition I was raised in since I was born, Catholicism, which nourishes me to this day, has been largely unresponsive to the issue of racial injustice. One of the three prose essays in my thesis was an attempt to bring the unresponsiveness of Catholic reviewers of Coates' book into conversation with the honest anger of my high school students, who I knew would be leaving at the end of the school year. This was a way to honor them in my thesis. I also wanted to consider the unresponsiveness of Catholic artists and officials to the suffering within their own church, namely to victims of clergy sex abuse. In his second essay, I looked at the political engagement, the prophetic and lament-based work of so many African-American poets, and asked why was there not comparable work from Catholic artists in response to the destruction of so many lives as a result of clergy sex abuse. In both the review essay and the comparison essay, I was circling back over this idea of how does an artist speak truth to power. In some cases, it became clear to me this was through denunciation and judgment. Coates curses those who acted unjustly, as countless poets have before him, and as I showed I did in my own work. But cursing is only half of the poetic equation. It does not carry nourishment in it. It only clears the ground. Dante's Inferno is the first part of a three-part journey, from that place in hell where he witnesses Ugolino chewing on the archbishop's skull. Dante has a lot of work to do on himself before he's ready to see his beloved Beatrice, let alone see God. So what does a blessing look like in a poem? I want to read you a poem that I learned in one of the first of many of Deborah's poetry classes. It's a poem that changed my life. It made me want to do for others with my own words what that poem did for me. This is Yehuda Amakai's letter of recommendation. On summer nights, I sleep naked in Jerusalem. My bed stands on the brink of a deep valley without rolling down into it. In the daytime, I walk around with the Ten Commandments on my lips like an old tune someone hums to himself. Oh, touch me, touch me, you good woman. That's not a scar you feel under my shirt. That's a letter of recommendation folded up tight from my father. All the same, he's a good boy and full of love. I remember my father waking me for early prayers. He would do it by gently stroking my forehead, not by tearing away the blanket. Since then, I love him even more. And as his reward, may he be wakened gently and with love on the day of resurrection. There is great power in gratitude. A poem like this one moves the reader through its specificity of thanks the memory of a boy being awakened gently for prayer, but also by its recognition that in naming the act, a person's love can grow and give new nourishment to both the namer and to the one being named. As I said before, I think it's easier to write good curses than good blessings. Dante may have had to do a lot of work in himself before he saw Beatrice and the Lord, but people seem to remember and like Dante's Inferno a lot better than his purgatory, his paradise. Part of what I wanted to do with my thesis statement, though, was to do the kind of specific naming involved in blessing that Amikai does in the poem I just read. And there were two blessings in particular I wanted to count in this book. The writing community at Hamlin, which has supported me and inspired me to be a poet, and Christina, my wife, whose love has nourished me in ways I'm only beginning to understand. And we just got married September 4th. Very excited. It's right here. <laughs> As many of you know, it's very difficult to write something for a person you love. How, are you, how can you be intimate and reveal yourself and yet not be an exhibitionist? How can you be specific and particular to the moment and yet not close the poem off to anyone who is not you and your beloved? I struggle with these issues like anyone else, and I'm certainly not the person to judge whether it's all of them in poems I wrote. I can read one of them for you, though. Here's a poem called Another Poem About the Body of Christ. I go again to receive on Sunday. 
steps I walk in the carpeted church feel like another man's steps. The soft amen I mutter when the gentle old lady holds up the host feels like another man's amen. The tongue is mine, though. I lay the host atop it. What I mean when I write that I felt like another man walking up the aisle for communion. It didn't have to be me. It didn't have to be me held and loved by my mother and father as a baby. It didn't have to be me held and loved by Christina next to me in the pew. But it was. It is. I thank you, God. I don't understand. Christina's hair is dark brown with a little red. When I watch it shot through with sunlight, I can see the auburn glow. I touch her beautiful, broad nose with my finger. She is sleeping. I lay the thoughts in my mind on the bed beside us. They sing softly for the breaking of the day. Besides naming the gratitude I had for Christina, I also wanted to name the gratitude I had for the teachers who were so generous with their time and insight during my time here at Hamlin. Because of the communal nature of this blessing, I didn't feel I could do justice to it in a poem or even a series of poems, so instead I wrote another essay. There's a lot of prose <laughs> in this thesis of a poet. Um, the beginning of my thesis was an essay called On Gratitude and Influence, and it names in particular ways the ways that Pat Francisco, Jim Moore, Katrina Vandenberg, and Deborah Keenan nourished and supported me as a writer, big ways and small, especially as I was coming to terms with writing critically about the church that I love. Each of these teachers had unique ways of bringing new work out of me, but all of them shared in common an abiding respect and awareness of what was new and fresh in my voice. The qualities that were not new and fresh, that others could say and say better, these they taught me to detect and remove. Reading my work through their eyes helped me clear space for the words I needed to say. Any graduate of this program can speak to the breadth and depth of reading we do at Hamlin, and this reading is truly shared. We read books and discuss them again and again. As a poet, this has been one of the greatest gifts I've received, and I want to end my reflection with something simple, a memory of one of those shared readings that has bearing on my own obsessions as a writer. This was in a class two years ago this fall with Jim Moore. He assigned us to read Rebecca Lindenberg's book, Love and Index. The book itself is wonderful. A passionate, thoughtful, politically aware tribute to the poet's disappeared beloved, Craig Arnold. What stays with me, though, in addition to the poems, was the conversation we had a week after reading with Jim, Rebecca, the poet was there, and that wonderful class full of students. I remember Rebecca Lindenberg saying at one point in the discussion, that a love poem can do so much more than we think it can. It can speak on politics and history and botany and religion and a thousand other things, as their own book does. There are so many good questions in that class, as there always are for moments like this at Hamlin. At the end of the class, Rebecca turned to Jim and said, I wish we could keep going. I want this conversation to continue. Here we all were face to face with a poet reminded of why she writes poetry in the first place to be read passionately and well by other people. Rebecca said, I want this conversation to continue. After five years and a degree later, I say the same to you tonight. Thank you.
of emotions. I think that's what I was trying to do with that book. So it's the, the, you know, the, the poem that I first read, you know, down to real life today. Like now all the poems in the book are like that angry. Um, you know, and I, and I think anyone who's honest and wants to convey like the range of human experience is going to let anger in. That, and I felt like I really, you know, I kind of went to bat for that poem, you know, like making sure it was in the, in the book even though it named names because I felt like for this moment, like it, you had uh, that had to be part of the, the story. The anger was part of it. But I think if anger is the only part of it, then I, I think that's that could be a really destructive human emotion. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, so I, I don't know if you if you ever read William Butler Yeats, the poet. You know, people say like some of his like he's he's this great like romantic love poet, but like the poems that I think are remembered today are like September 1916. Where it's like I name all these people who are martyrs to the cause and and then there's like a real power in just like like almost like performatively uttering the thing and I think that's what I'm really interested in I think that can happen in blessing too like we're basically you know in the Amakai poem it's like it's it's like he's conferring something the, the poet is conferring something on his his father so I, I think maybe the answer to your question is just like if you can be alive to the, if I can be alive as a poet to the moment of like doing something with my words in the moment like actually trying to perform something it's a, that's what I want. Like that's almost magical. I think in poetry when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Zach, uh, on that same poem, the uh, "It Doesn't Work Like Today." That's all we're going to talk about. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you talked about that kind of feeling of truth to power and working within the diocese while you're writing it, and mm -hmm. that it. I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Do you think it was more of a? Um, does it fuel you creatively to to have that kind of feeling of I don't know, danger, or does it fuel you just in terms of getting you fired up and, and moving? Uh, I think Pat, you're the one who said like no no risk for the writer, no risk for the reader, something along those lines. I guess I am definitely drawn to moments where there's something at stake. So yeah, like that. But to me, there's something at stake. Like I. I know these people, you know, and I, and, I, and I think it means something to say something to them. So it's not like I'm, I'm like trying to like go out of my way to find something that's going to make put, get me in trouble, but like I think if there's not any risk, uh, you, you, if you're not vulnerable on the page, you know, I don't follow the saying. Like I, I don't, I'm not as interested in reading something like that. So I think I, I'm just interested in a space where, you know, what what you write down could have some consequence or bearing. You know, I mean, this is the United States of America, you know, it's not, I'm not hosted at Mandelstam, and like, Stalin's not coming after me, you know, like, so, like, let's be real here, you know, probably none of these. I don't know if Archbishop Ninestead could have been done to read that poem. Yeah. They, they, they cruise the poetry yeah. journal. Right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Same no. question Mary asked Paul. What about where does the material in the thesis prose or poetry go? Yeah, so the, the review, that the essay, the review essay on Coates' book, um, that is being published in the fall. Um, it's very different than it was. It's much more focused on my students and their discussion of uh, race and racism and racial injustice and Coates. It's much more like me, Coates, and the kids. Um, and I really like it. So like, I had a great editor at this, the other journal. It's a journal of theology and culture, and so they're publishing that. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then there's been a couple of poems in GIFT that have been picked up. One by Tinderbox, which is a local journal, um, and you know a couple other poems. So I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out like, do I do I put the, the, the things together, or do I like try to work on a, you know, a book of prose essays, like a collection of essays, or just a book of poems? I vote for that. For what? Book of prose essays. Okay. <laughs> 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 sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 